So we're going to cover the invitation section of starting a game when you reach out to players. But if this takes too long, I'm going to have a link up that direction for the pitch. Just because I don't want to bore you guys and I don't want to be on too long of a tangent because I want to get you the content you can use. But I find the example is very important. Starting out with how to do the invitation or the point of no return part of starting a game. The most important part of a pitch is you want to give everybody the same pitch. You're selling the value of the game, you're trying to get them interested. You want the people to also know what their expectations are. If they don't know what to expect or they just were left blanks and they have to fill it in, they're going to create in their mind the world that they need by filling in the pieces. They're gonna run wild with ideas that clash with what you have, and you're gonna to have to say no to a bunch of shit. And telling them no on their um, idea babies, if you will, feels like shit for them. So instead of making them feel dejected about their creativity and effort they put in, try to give them the expectations for what they should expect in the game. That's the importance of a pitch. So I like to give it to everybody all at the same time, same blurb if I can, because I've historically been working on the game and then through the pitch and then kept working on it. And so each person I told like days apart got more and more and more and more information. And the first guy got super short changed and made a crappy character because I failed. So try to give them all the pitch at the same time. Cut myself off because I'm getting on tangents. My pitch. I'm going to have to make that a separate video, which is not a big deal. Mine is going to be linked either at the end card or up that direction. Anyways, point two, party alchemy. There's a couple things to party alchemy that you want to pay attention to. So party alchemy regarding as a person, you want the party alchemy to contain no drama, no shit talkers, and I don't have an Oxford comma for you, so start with just those two. But I've had too many games that end up toxic because people are unhealthy about how they have relationships or they just don't play games well. Party alchemy as characters, so the characters that they're playing, you want to make sure that you don't have anything like the racist elf, which I love the role playing side of it, but nobody likes to be around a dick bag. Um, it's not fun. Um, I have no jerks, which is my second one because it's just what my character would do. And it's like, I don't care. You're being a dick to your friends. Like, don't let your character justify you pissing your friends off or treating your friends badly. Like, this is supposed to be a fun thing. Be the heroes like you're supposed to be in D&D First Ed. You could not actually play a villain in the first game. I think that's a swell rule, even though I've played plenty of evil games. Anyways. If you want to be bad, be the GM. Then you can attack your friends all you want. <laughs> to help party alchemy as characters, I like to put them through challenges. I will always try to, if I see issues, make them go through things that require them to work as a team. So I will either have them be split up and then a person on each side of the trap has to like push a button or one reads it and the other has to do the things that they read or there's a hint outside the room that the one person's stuck in or if they're not split up have it be too high up to climb and so one person has to be on somebody else's back and then they can jump up like or it's an army of 50 people and there's no goddamn way that one person should kill them all um be careful if you do that with undead undead can be murdered quickly by clerics anyways that's a way that you can take the character party alchemy into your own abilities, control, and responsibilities. You can design a game to have challenges that make them work together and value each other. Also read comedy books. Comedy books teach you how to work together on stage. So, secret tip there. And then party alchemy through play styles. If you have two different people who, for example, one wants to be the crazy high-powered explosion min-maxer, and he's like blasting fucking crowds of people, destroying castles, like crazy stuff, and he loves doing that. Let them throw dice. And then you've got your other guy over here 
who's the traveling baker for village orphans. And he's like, oh, I just like to give people bread and cookies. And it's like, you could have a great game with a lot of role playing with that baker, but he's going to feel useless and he's not going to get any time and he's going to be valueless on anything regarding combat, especially when compared to the big exploder. So you want to make sure that those two people are under the same expectation of what the game is, as well as, yeah, that actually fixes most of it. If they know what to expect, then the big exploiter can either chill out or the baker, you can help them make something really cool and like have exploding cookies, which actually knew a baker who had explosive um, cookies and things like that. There's many types of play styles. You've got the high powered ones, the murder hobos, the wants to roll as many dice as possible. I'm looking at you sneak attack rogues. Um, people who just want to role play raising a puppy. People who are starving pirates. Cowboy Bebop and Firefly. Um, or just looking to play a struggling band of combat musicians. Like There's tons of different ways to play. And you want to make sure that your people are in a cohesive idea. Because if one person wants to sit there and be a perfect blacksmith, but he can't stay at his forge, you've just screwed his whole backstory. And he's going to be unhappy and he's going to have to force his character to be like, Oh, well, I guess I can travel instead of doing everything I planned. And my backstory and my family stays here, I guess. You want to make sure that the pitch is good because that will actually sort out the play styles because they'll know what to expect and they can decide if they want to play in the game or not. Got a little lengthy. I might cut that out. We'll see. But yeah, nothing feels worse than if you want to be good at one thing and this dude broke the system and he's good at everything, you should be good at yours and feel good about what you built your character to do because you put all the effort in to earn that. This dude's a dick and he abused the system. So just keep an eye out for those two types of players. And that's also why I'm playing a low to no magic game. It's in a system most of them are foreign to. No one can abuse the numbers, and I'm helping them build it so the new guy can abuse them a little bit to catch up with the guy who's played before. That's my way of working with that. To those guys who do that and abuse the numbers, and their friend is role-playing something and they get overshadowed, like, terribly every time, you're a dick. Anyways, to the masochist calendar. Scheduling the game... So scheduling the game is a nightmare usually. It eventually becomes an issue once people become adults. Their calendars are like impossible to get more than two people in a room. And you end up with like every second Friday of the third moon you'll end up playing a game. Garbage. It's a nightmare. So be consistent. You're going to be working with people's work schedules and school schedules. Is there a good day for each of them? I'm specifically doing every other Thursday. That way there's time for people to have a life. And there's a little bit of a grace period for me to plan out the game or forget to and then plan because life sometimes gets crazy. Um, every week over time gets to be way too much. Um, it is too much for the time that I invest in making my games. If you're crazy and you have nothing to do, go for it. You also need it to be short enough period that you maintain the story or interest. If it's more than two weeks, you start like really challenging their memory because life gets in the middle. What I do is I will do every other, I will do every other week, but a few days before I will start rotating through my people one at a time and I will ask them, Hey, what are you looking forward to game? Hey, do you remember what happened with this and that? Or, um, did you write down this on your character sheet? I can't find it or something like that And I'll prompt them to remember and get excited about game a day or two ahead of time to prime their minds back into it So it's not like breaking the rust off the wheels every time you start a game up um, It also keeps them engaged and they won't skip your game attendance nearly as much Had that happen plenty of times and then also in the masochist calendar you probably want the food scheduled. If you're more organized than I am, you'll have like people on a calendar and you'll be like, okay, this week is Joe, this week's Bob, this week's Carrie. It's like 
the calendar doesn't usually work for D&D players because they're a little bit scattered and they'll forget. So some people it will, some it won't. If you're a DM who loves writing out calendars and agendas, feel free to remind people, hey, your week's coming up, yada yada. I'm planning to probably end up chasing people down and being like, okay, John, your week's coming up. What's your plan for food? Do we have to worry about anything? And then that'll at least take it off my mind because I overcalculate and I'll be worried about it if I don't poke and have at least some semblance of knowing it's handled. But that's my personality, so I'm working with me. Is the potluck, are they eating before game? Are they trading who's doing food each time? It gets to be really expensive for one person to always keep doing the food. I've done that before when I was in college and I don't think people really realized it. So is what it is. Um, don't be a burden to your friends. Be a team. Toss the poor guy some money if it is a single guy. Or one thing I'm planning to do is potentially offer them bonuses in game or a get out of crap free card for whoever the grub lord is that game. I like the term Grub Lord. I'm probably going to keep that. But yeah, I'm going to have one get out of crap free card for whoever it is. It'll be a physical card. That way it's in front of them on their character sheet and they don't forget about it. But that'll at least give positive reinforcement to whoever brings the food. And it'll also point people to tell them, hey, use this, like, and remind them that that person was awesome for bringing the fucking food. One other thing that I sometimes do, which I'm not going to go into, is player quizzes. If you're sending out an invite, you want to get your people invited, this and that, and then I sometimes send them out a quiz to get their minds on track. I had some games with weird requirements, or I had people who I knew didn't roleplay, um, and I wanted them to. And so I sent out a quiz with very provoking questions, and it helped them build their character out and not just be a number block but actually think about the personality of that character. Um, I could do an episode on that sometime if you ask for it. It's not going to be before this series finishes, just a heads up, but it will get onto the list if you poke me about it. That was a very long tirade and tangent about how I invite people to the game. Now the scary part is I have to actually do it because once the invite is sent out, the ball's in motion and there's nothing I can do to stop it. Next up is the first collision, character creation. It's usually a train wreck, and I'll go into why later.